You're tuned into Toby Talks, episode 24. When your nursing career gets tough, duke it up. Yo, can we talk about challenges though? Like, can we talk about opposition? We got to talk about setback. You guys, this dope episode with Katie Duke had me lit. It was so amazing to hear her story of how she just, through each season of her life and nursing career, she was duking it up, like straight up, duke, just do, 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 duking it up. And that's really what your life is going to be like as a nurse. You're going to have different kind of challenges, oppositions, and setbacks, starting from nursing school all the way into your career and moving up. And this does not exclude your life, y'all. There's always going to be different kind of things that's going to get in your way or set you back. But the thing is, you got to duke it up. You got to keep going and don't let nothing stop you. On today's episode with Katie Duke, she definitely goes in depth with her life and shares some personal stories of how she went from grass to grace. And let me tell you something. Don't be fooled by the 50 point something million followers she got or thousands. I don't even know. She got a lot of followers on Instagram, y'all. She is the most down to earth, seasoned sister like that's my vanilla pound cake y'all so i really hope y'all i'm just too excited let's go ahead and hop into this conversation thank you for having me on toby talk (laughs) you are so welcome well let's go ahead and hop into this i and so many other listeners want to know how did you even fall into nursing how did nursing become the career choice that you picked i mean tell me about that Oh, Lord, girl, how much time we got here in this podcast? Uh, We got got some time. We got some time. (laughs) Um, Let me give you the Cliff Notes version of it. Um, So I, um, again, disclaimer out here for people who do or do not know me, I have, um, you know, I have, everyone has a lot of skeletons in their closet. I am totally cool with, you know, talking about mine and owning the, uh, the shit that I've gone through. So uh-huh. it, my nursing school story is a little different than other people. Um, my mom's a nurse, my sister's a nurse, my aunt's a nurse, my cousin's a nurse. And I never really wanted to be a nurse. I was in high school and I was kind of just feeling like, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. I don't even know if I want to go to college and my, um, my senior year in high school. I started dating this really just this I started dating a scumbag. We so all I've done high that. School, I didn't go to college mm. right away. Mm-hmm. I took a I took a bunch of time off and um I was like I'm going to get a I'm going to get a job and I'm going to work. So I started working in like a sandwich shop making like $5.15 an hour and I decided, "Oh, I'm just going to move in with my boyfriend. I clearly know what I'm doing with my life." <laughs> moved in with him and um he became an alcoholic about like four months after we moved in together and mm-hmm. he started abusing me pretty severely. And mm-hmm. um, I would spend um, a lot of time in the emergency room. And I remember um, I was like, man, like this is, um, you know, th- this is, this is kind of fucked up. Like how am I the one who's in this situation? I have mm-hmm. like a good supportive family. I, I finished high school, you know, and this is back in St. Louis, Missouri many years ago. But I'm like, you know, this isn't what I like. This isn't exactly what I imagined. But when you're in a domestic violence relationship, you have been whittled down to such a low amount of self-esteem that you start to think maybe I just deserve this life. Mm. So I was in the situation for about um, about two years. And finally, one night uh, I was watching TV at like 3 a.m. And um, I was like, I had like pawned my high school ring. He had like told my car. He had cheated wow. on me with like, he had said, dude, fucked every girl in the hood, like mm. literally. And I was like pawning my jewelry for beer money just to avoid getting beat every night. And I was sitting up at three o'clock in the morning and a whole bunch of infomercials came on TV. And there was one for a local nursing school. And it was like, you want to be a nurse. Come and help the people of St. Louis. We're taking applications for fall semester. And I was like, I think I need to, I think I need, I think I need to do this. Mm. So nursing kind of found me when I was at a very low point in my life. Um, And it was very, it was very much like a, 
like a um, like a very pivotal moment. I remember sitting like in we lived in basically like a condemned apartment. Like we had no drywall on the walls. We had mm-hmm. an extension cord running to the neighbors for electricity. Mm. I, I I basically plugged a hot pot into like an electricity like cord an extension cord every night to make dinner. I mean, like there was, there was, there was one room, like it was just bad. And I remember mm. watching this infomercial and I was just like, man, like nursing is the thing for me. And it's interesting because I grew up around a whole family of nurses. So it had always been something very familiar to me, but I just never really knew that it was, you know, that that's what I was meant to be doing. So a um, couple days later, I went down and I visited the school and I was like, oh, yeah, I finished high school. I could probably apply to this college. And that was when they told me, you know, that you, you would have to take, you know, a bunch of prerequisites. And so flash forward, I went to community college for two years then transferred to the nursing school and then ended up getting my associate's degree. And that was in 2004 that I finished my associate's degree. So, like, you know, everybody, I think, has a different story about why they why they went to college or why they chose the profession they Mm -hmm. did. But sometimes I kind of tell people that I didn't really choose nursing. It just kind of picked me when I needed help out of a really, really deep hole that I had drugged myself in. So um, there you go. Girl, that hit the soul. My goodness. Start on a podcast. (laughs) No, I love it. Welcome to Toby Talks with Katie Duke. We're just going to hit you over the head with some major (laughs) drama and then get on into it. (laughs) But that's real, though. I would not, I would hate to sugarcoat and put flowers and and icing on things that aren't real. Like, let's talk about it. Let's be real. Like, nursing found you at the pivot of the point where you needed it in your life. And that story is so captivating. Yeah. You have no idea how many other people are probably sitting the same time waiting for an infomercial like that to hit them up. You know, like I've seen so many, but for to actually but, hear an yeah, infomercial like, change your so life many, is good. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, there's so many women that, I mean, there's so many women in bad situations, I think, that put their own personal progress on hold because they're trying to save a relationship that that is that is destined for failure that is not good that's not healthy you know and so i had this 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 kind of just this very awakening moment and you know it was that moment that you know sort of reminded me like actually you know what like you don't have to live like this Mm -hmm. you don't have to be you know boiling water on a gas stove to like a fucking bath. Mm. You do not have to be, you know, like selling your jewelry to buy liquor so your boyfriend, when he gets home from his construction job, doesn't beat the shit out of you because he had a bad day. Mm. It was, it, it's crazy. I look back on these moments and I'm like, man, like I had basically, you know, um, s- kind of just separated myself from my family so yeah. much. I mean, our, we were so distant at that time because. I knew that I was making bad choices with who I was surrounding myself with yeah. and, and just and just with everything. Yeah. And I knew that, you know, that they would call me out on it. And I was just too ashamed. And I don't know. But um, anyway, eventually I, um, he and I had such a bad blowing out, you know, after I had started, um, you know, some of those nursing classes. And one night he, he actually took like a closed fist to my face and my, fucked up like the whole left side of my face and I was like all right now it's time to leave yeah I went home kind of confessed to my dad you know like what all had happened and um they welcomed me back home and I you know went to a little bit of therapy and whatnot and um finished my way through nursing school and um you know a lot of people might look at me and be like I don't understand why you didn't just leave because everybody always wants to say that. Everyone I always know. wants to point their fingers and say, wow. all you have to do is lead. But until you have been in that situation, you just, um, you know, why women and men yeah. stay in abusive relationships. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, I think that, again, we all have, we all have something different here and there that, that kind of saves us or, or pulls us out of the situation. And, and mine was definitely nursing, so... And I love that because not only are you sharing the what you went through to even get into nursing, how nursing found you, you're sharing like I think people forget that even though you're in nursing school, life is still happening. You're going through shit as you're still in nursing school. Nothing like nursing school isn't yeah. perfect where everything just kind of stops and you're just taking tests and taking oh, exams and going to clinical. Like 
Yeah. No, it's not. So it's I, def- yeah, it's I definitely not perfect. That. So as we kind of turn yeah. the tables a little bit, can you kind of talk to me, like share with me how nursing school from your journey of an associate's degree to becoming an MP, how was that journey for you and what continued to push you and inspire you to keep going forward? Well, I mean, I never really had this major push to go forward, um, like all at once. So, I mean, I started out with my um, associate's degree in 2004, because I mean, shit, that damn near 20 years ago, it was like everybody had an associate's degree back then. And mm-hmm. I'm in St. Louis, like nobody really cared about bachelor's versus B, and there was no such thing as a BMP. Now I'm dating myself, <laughs> but. Um, you know, people kind of just everybody kind of started out with an associate's degree. And so I got that and I started working on a med search for, made some really great friends, had a really great preceptor, thank God, who's actually now still one of my best friends to this day. Aww, and, um, you know, I really liked it. But I got two years into working on a med search floor, I was like, I don't know if I kind of want something different. I felt like I needed something different. So um, I went and I, I took a job as like a local travel nurse and mm-hmm. I traveled to different facilities all around St. Louis. I did everything from um, psychiatric hospital assignments to um, like emergency room, like like level two emergency room assignments. Mm. I, even, I even did an assignment at a wound and vent hospital. Mm. Can we have a moment of silence for that? Wow. Or can you, can you, can you like put the sound effect <laughs> in there where someone's like, where like a bomb is dropping on a city? Because and I'm pouring 40 out for my vent homies. Hospital? Definitely. <laughs> yes. yes. Because wound and vent hospital, every patient is traked. Every patient is um, on a clinitron bed and every single patient is on like two feedings contracted and Ooh, like, Lord, mercy. like out of it. And they all have wound vacs. And I'm like, Jesus, I can see why this place cannot keep any staff. Oh, my God. Right? Anyway, wow. so, so I kind of, you know, rotated around to a lot of different places. And, um, and then I got a job in the um, cardiothoracic and, like, cardiovascular step-down unit, mm-hmm. uh, which I liked. But then I just kind of felt like something was, I don't know, like, I just kind of felt like there was not much in St. Louis for me. And I was like, I just felt kind of stagnant. And I was like, you know, I just, I just feel like there's something else out there for me that's just a little bigger than what I'm doing now. Mm. But I never really knew what it was. And so I was like, well, what's the, what's the complete opposite of St. Louis? That would be New York. So yeah. I decided to take a travel assignment and go to New York. Never been in New York a day in my life. I had never had any family who's been here. Um, I mean, I don't have any family anywhere on the East Coast except for like the Carolinas and Georgia. But I took a travel assignment, moved up here, started working at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And I really liked that hospital. And I ended up going on staff about a year and a half after being a traveler. And when I was on staff, I was really involved with things. I became a charge nurse. I became a triage nurse. I precepted over the course of seven years, like 42 new graduates. Wow. Um, and part of our fellowship training program. And I was very involved in staff education. I really, mm. really liked, um, I really liked being that person that made it feel like a welcoming environment. However, yeah. in order to be a part of a lot of these hospital committees, you need your bachelor's degree. Mm. So this is why I went back to get my bachelor's degree. So I had to go back and get my BSN, which I finished in New York at City University, New York, Hunter College. And I guess it was like, um, about like uh, just really just like a couple months, like before I was finishing my BSN, I was like, I mean, listen, I'm already in like this the groove of of being back in school. I have no man, I have no family up there. I really have shit else to do with my time, mm-hmm. and I'm kind of feeling like I'm gonna be burnt out in a few years. I was working in a level one trauma pediatric adult trauma and burn center in New York City. I was working like nights. I was working fifty, sixty hours a week. Wow. And I was like, if I keep going at this rate, I'm going to get burnt out. And yeah. um, and I kind of felt like I wanted to eventually do more. So I figured since you're already in the group, why don't you see if you can apply to some programs for grad school? Mm-hmm. So um, I took the GRE. Oh, my God. Um, I, I literally, I didn't realize that you had to take the GRE. 
So when I was applying, I found out that there was a GRE deadline and it was three days from like the date that I looked it up. So I had two days to study for the GRE and I ended up wow. getting a decent score. I got into Columbia University. What? <laughs> uh, and don't ask me how, because I, to this day, to this day, I don't, everything on the GRE was a foreign language to me. So the GRE, um, just the anyway, acronym is a foreign language to me. <laughs> Forget even studying it, just the hearing the yeah, acronym. Yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah, like, uh, it's just, it's just, it's just a terrible thing. Whew. But, um, so literally right after I finished with my BSN, I started graduate school like that following semester. And I got into the acute care nurse practitioner program at Columbia University. And, um, you know, and honestly, like getting into Columbia was probably the biggest deal of my life. I, for a long time, had always kind of been that one in my family that was like the black sheep. Mm -hmm. Um, I had always been the one that, you know, had a little trouble here and there or just hung around the wrong crowd or had all the tattoos and drove the motorcycle and cursed a lot and Mm -hmm. dated all the scumbags. Like, I had just always been, oh, there's that. Well, there's one in every family. Well, that was me. (laughs) So when I got into Columbia, I almost felt like vindicated, like, Aha, family, in look your here. Face. I'm smart. Look at that. I am worthy. In mm-hmm. your face. Yes, look at me. I got into Columbia. I am worthy of your love. <laughs> 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 like it was it was funny cuz my my family when I when I told everybody they're like, "Are you sure that's Columbia, New York City?" And I'm like, "Yep, or it's Columbia, the real the Columbia." Country. They're like, "Oh my god." Oh my god. <laughs> it was it's kind of it's kind of like a running joke. So, um so when I started that program, I knew I wanted to choose uh, the master's of science um, in nursing as an acute care nurse practitioner, because um, I had always kind of worked in some form of acute of acute care, critical care nursing. And I really enjoyed that. Um, but I was kind of going back and forth between that and, you know, um, I really like nursing education also, but mm-hmm. I decided to choose the clinical nurse practitioner path because you can still do both. I can still help and do education. Uh, you know, I can still precept clinical students or mm-hmm. I can maybe teach undergrad students. But if I was to do the nursing education degree, I would not be able to work clinically as an NP. So that's the story behind all of my degrees. Um, I have my CLS. I have my PALS. I actually did have my CCRN and my CEN, but I let them both expire after I became a nurse practitioner because let's just be honest, I'm not getting paid any extra money to keep them shit legitimate. Hello. Okay, there you go. There a lot you of people it. don't even know um, that. <laughs> they need to know that. <laughs> yeah. So after you become a nurse practitioner, um, your CCRN and your CEN and your PCCN and all those CCNs, They don't mean anything because when you get hired by a hospital or um, I can only speak from hospital based practice. When you get hired by a hospital, the only board certification they pay you for is your board certification as a nurse practitioner and whatever your specialty is. Mm -hmm. You don't get paid extra for two or three or five board certifications. Now, if I was a doctor, however, I would be paid extra for all of those. But that's a different conversation for a different day, honey. That show is. Um, We're going to table that one. mm -hmm. Mm. Girl, it, it sure is. But, but like, just to play devil's advocate, they also have 15 years more training and education than nurses. So, you know, I, I get it. But um, anyway, so that's why I never really, like, cared to renew those or, or, or re-pursue them after I became a nurse practitioner. And so now as a nurse practitioner, um, I applied for several jobs. I really had awesome clinical sites. I loved my program at Columbia. Um, I got to do some clinical sites that were just absolutely um, just fucking fascinating mm. at some of the world's top institutions. I did the, I did the surgical, I the sorry, the, the ICU at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which is the world's number one cancer research institution. I, and in the ICU there, oh my gosh. Wow. We, I mean, there are patients that fly from all over the world with the most rare, fascinating type of cancers that, um, you know, and when you work in the ICU there, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Every patient is involved in a clinical trial and they are changing, they're changing the narrative for how we treat these, you know, terrible diseases and you're there doing clinicals. And it's like, wow, in five years, the shit they're doing on my patient is going to be the standard protocol. Yeah. And it's going to yeah. cure pancreatic cancer. Like it's, it's really great. Wow. And then I was in the at Columbia University 
and um, which was just which was just amazing. If you've ever seen ECMO, it's it's um it's pretty fascinating. But we had all these really just these amazing preceptors and these really great professors. So I enjoyed my grad school program, um, but you know. I never really realized I would take a position in cardiology. Honestly, when you're a new grad MD, unless you already have like an in mm-hmm. at some hospital or facility, you're going to kind of take whatever job offer you can get. Mm. And I tell this to people all the time. I'm like, listen, like beggars can't be choosers. You're a new know, nurse practitioner. Right. It's like being an experienced nurse is one thing, but being a new nurse practitioner means that you are still new and mm. you have to kind of start all over. So I applied for um, a bunch of different nurse practitioner positions. I had three interviews. The first interview was at NYU. And they made me cry halfway through my interview because all they wanted oh. to talk about was fire from New York Med. And my social media uh, situation. And Hmm. uh, my second interview was at Sloan Kettering. And it was a great interview, but they only offered me a fellowship position. And it was paying a little over half of what I make now. Wow! I just didn't want to take that because it was 60 hours a week plus call, no benefits and no guarantee of a job at the end of the year. Even though looking back, like if I had a second income back then, I probably would have done it. Mm -hmm. But um, it wasn't the right thing then. And then my third interview was at another hospital that shall remain nameless in New York City. Um, It's one of the top 10 hospitals in the U.S. And it was for their inpatient cardiology service. And um, I've been there for three years now. And I actually really enjoy it. It's, it's, It's interesting how things work out because I remember I was just like, man, I don't know like where I want to work and uh, cardiology. Oh, it's so different from the ER, but I was burnt out on the ER. But, you know, listen, you have to give everything a chance. You do. So I was glad that I did. Wow. And it all came together in your in your favor, too. I mean, I'm just, your story is so freaking motivating. I'm just like, what? I'm on the edge of my seat. Like, dang, homegirl, I've been through the most. And look oh. at you, you're still coming up on top. And I, I love that so much. And I kind of wanted to change. I appreciate the, that. Um, you're welcome, girl. You're welcome. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to change <laughs> the, um, the, the topic of discussion and kind of hop to social media. So I actually, yeah. through another friend, um, found out about you through social media. And what kind of captivated me so much about you on social media was that you were bomb Like you are on there just highlighting nursing, highlighting being an empowering woman. Like you've taken social media platform to not just be about pictures and just my everyday life, but you kind of take us along with you. You take us along with you on your health journey, on your, on your different, um, patients that you might see or things that you might want to discuss about healthcare. How did that come about? Was that something that you always did on social media or how did you just become this true influencer for nurses like me and so many others that are listening? Girl, you over here got me blushing over here. Girl, you better Girl. blush too. You, you <laughs> doing it. <laughs> so, um, in 2011, um, I was working um, at New York Presbyterian um, Cornell Medical Center in New York City in the ER, and ABC decided to film a documentary series um, at my hospital, and they were choosing three nurses to follow out of the emergency room. I was one of the nurses that they chose to follow. Now, the TV show was called um, NY Med, New York Med, and um, Dr. Oz was on it. It was on ABC Primetime. Hmm. And it aired first in the um, it aired first in um, 2000 and like fall 2011. And um, the interesting about the interesting thing about the show is, you know, when everything when all the filming and everything first started, the hospital's PR department was like, listen, you are being handed a huge opportunity here. And the ABC producers were like, listen, like come to our office, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to kind of talk to you guys about what's going to happen with all this. And I remember mm-hmm. walking into uh, walking into Terry Wrong's office. Terry Wrong was, was the executive producer for, for the show. Mm-hmm. And he has this office in ABC headquarters on, over on the west side of New York. And when I walk in, there's Peabody Awards, there's Emmy Awards, there's all this recognition for like excellence in journalism and I was very fascinated by this because Mm -hmm. it was then that I realized like this is not going to be some podunk 
half-assed reality show. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to make anybody look like Nurse Jackie. This is not a, you know, nurses who kill their patients kind of show. I said this Mm. is an actual documentary series, but it's giving the perspective of the healthcare provider instead of the patient, which is a very rare thing. Very rare. But even more rare than that, you know what they said to us? They said, we want to film nurses because nurses are a huge part of healthcare and the hospital system and the patient experience. And I said, it's really interesting that you say that because up until this time, and remember this is back in 2010, 2011, up until that time, and even now, how many shows can you name on TV where you actually have like a real nurse doing what like real nurses do? You you really can't. Now, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not talking about like, like scripted sitcoms and scripted dramas are okay. And they kind of have gotten better over the years, but I'm not Nurse Jackie. I'm not banging the pharmacist and I do not have a drug problem. I am not a serial killer from A&E and (laughs) and investigation discovery. And I'm not some dumb idiot like trailing behind the doctor with a clipboard. Those are the typical nurses and how we are always displayed on TV. And, you know, um, so when they told us, Listen, we really want to we really want to highlight nurses on the show. I was very honored and I was really excited. So when we kind of got everything started, they started filming in the emergency room and filming all over um, the hospital. They filled some trauma surgeons as well. And um, you know, the PR department was like, you know, you should really start like a Twitter and a Facebook and an Instagram page because this is gonna be a really popular show and then you can help promote the show. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I set up a couple different pages, my Twitter, my Instagram, my Facebook page, like a public Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I just started tweeting things about daily life, working in the hospital um, and and being a nurse in New York City, especially being an ER nurse in New York City. Mm -hmm. And people were actually interested. (laughs) People, um, there was actually like a whole community out there in the internet world of people who wanted to know what it was like as a nurse or maybe wanted to be a nurse when they grew up but didn't have anyone to look up to. Like when you're a little kid and you know you want to play ball, you watch every single Kobe and LeBron and Jordan video. You go to their summer camps. Mm -hmm. You watch their movies. You read their books. If you want to be an artist, you have researched everything about Frida Kahlo and you have researched everything about Basquiat and yeah. and um, George Surratt and you've gone to all the art museums. But what do you do if you want to be a nurse? Who do we look Crickets. to? Mm. Exactly. Crickets. So when you want to be a nurse, what do you got to fucking Google and all you hear is the shit about Florence Nightingale from 200 yep, years thank ago? thank you. Oh, girl, gone and dead. And we still... Okay, sorry. That hit a point from me. Gone and dead. Gone and gone dead. Gone and dead. And, and, I mean, and don't even get me started on... Yes, there are some nurses in the media, but guess what? They are 66 years old. They have thank 17 Thank you. Babies, they on have the verge hair, of retiring. And they do not... God. They they have nurse hair. They have nurse hair, and they also are just not relatable. Not okay. At all. So I decided. I decided then. I was like, this is a huge opportunity. I said, I'm about to be on an ABC primetime documentary series, doing what I do best. Um, and it's completely unscripted. It's what you see is what you get. And I said, people are going to be watching this, and I maybe this is why I got called to New York. Mm. So I kind of connected the dots, and I was like. Maybe this was what I am meant to be doing when I said I felt like there's something bigger out there for me. So season one came along and um, I was like tweeting stuff and posting stuff. I started doing some YouTube videos, just about all kinds of different things. And I felt like I was really um, I was really into it. I really enjoyed it. I was very candid and I was not afraid to talk about things that other people didn't want to talk about. And again, this was in 2010, 2011. And it's like no one had social media back then. It was yeah, very, girl, very, very, I was very in school so I definitely didn't have social media back there I was too busy trying to study for exams yeah. so this is like a whole world yeah going on wow yeah exactly and so um you know when I when I was doing all of this I was still learning a lot of lessons um but also at the same time at the hospital that I worked at um I was getting a lot of bullying and I was going through a lot of um hostile work environment because let's face it nursing is very catty Nursing can be a very, very um, difficult profession to work in, yes. like above and beyond the patient, the patient issues. I'm talking about the colleagues. Yes. So I was in an emergency room where they had 135 nurses and there was 128 of them were female. 
So oh. let's just leave that there for a minute. Ooh. Now what you're going to do is you're going to throw into the Shark Tank a whole camera crew of ABC cameramen following you around everywhere you go, going on vacation with you, filming you out with your friends. And people got very jealous. People yeah. got very hateful. And people started to treat us You know, they started to treat us differently. Mm -hmm. And when they started to treat us differently, you know, I started noticing things like, oh, I was getting written up. Um, I was getting, you know, complaints all of a sudden. And I had been there for years and I never had any problems. I was the only nurse to achieve three promotions while I was there in the history of the whole ER. I trained everybody. I was just so involved. So I was like, man, why why is all this happening just because I'm taking part of the show? Like, I haven't changed. I'm still the same nurse and mm-hmm. I'm still the same person. So I continued. I'm like, no, you know what? I'm not going to stop doing all the social media stuff. So season one was over. There was a total of 36 million viewers, which was initially kind of really helped kind of boost a presence. And I remember the first time I hit like five, ten thousand 10,000 followers, I was like, oh, my God, I'm famous. My life is made. <laughs> but, like, you know, like I never... I never did it because I'm like, I want to be famous that, you know, back in the day I was doing social media because there was a void in the industry. There was a void in the media and there was a void in the industry um, for a female healthcare personality, but also more specifically a nurse. Because if you look everywhere in on the planet, uh, especially in the news and in the media and social media, everything's doctor. We got Dr. Oz, Dr. Yeah. Besser, we have Dr. Phil, we have Dr. Gupta, we have the doctor's TV show. We have Dr. Mike, who, like, is he really even still a doctor or is he now just an influencer? Like, he, but, like but everything is male and physician dominated. So I decided, no, Katie Duke, stick with this. So I made the decision to stick with it, even though I was having some issues at work. Um, and then ABC came back and they said, we want to film a season two. And um, season two was the season where I, um, you know, had some drama come into my life. And that's one of the biggest things that I talk about on social media and at my events to this day is, you know, how we overcome mistakes Mm -hmm. and owning those mistakes Mm -hmm. and, you know, picking the lessons out of shitty situations and how we turn our stories and our bad decisions into our success. So how I got involved in social media, it was kind of just kind of thrown in my lap. But I saw a really great potential and a great opportunity there. And I saw something that I felt came naturally to me. Yeah. I love talking. I love sharing. I'm a people person. I love talking about all the dumb shit I've done in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm okay with that because just like Kevin Hart, like he makes fun of himself for being five feet tall. He knows he's five feet tall. No one will yeah. ever hurt his feelings because they make fun of him because he's a short man, because it is his main source of content. So I kind of take the same approach with social media. Like no one can ever, um, you know, like, like disempower you if you own your mistakes because, you know, we have this whole huge glorified version of what the ideal life is. And we see all these fucking fake ass, half ass people on Instagram and Facebook and social media and on all these trash ass reality shows with these made up lives and these unrelatable lives. And no one ever likes to talk about, like the real shit, yeah. like the things that have really got them down and how they came over that. And that's how we truly help each other. There is no Ooh, greater Katie. gift out there than the uh. gift to be able to actually share your story and own it and make other people out there in the same shoes feel like, you know what? I have potential still and I am, and I'm going to be okay and I'm going to make it through this. How do I turn this into my success? So that was kind of the reason behind why I started social media and why I talk about what I talk about. And, um, you know, again, it was, it was, it's very ironic because I, I got fired during season two. Um, we were filming season two and I got fired a few weeks into filming season two. Um, I had reposted a post, um, one of my, one of the physicians I worked with in the emergency room, he was a third third or fourth year ER resident, Mm -hmm. he had posted a picture on his Instagram of an empty trauma room. And I reposted the picture and I put a caption under there. And um, I was fired, like with no forewarning. Hmm. Um, And uh, it was it was revolving around that social media post, but it wasn't completely, you know, about the post. Mm -hmm. My manager, my director, my Durant, yeah, my manager and my director called me in the office, basically, um, you know, after I've been there like seven, seven and a half years. And they said, you're, we, so we really appreciate all the work you've done here. Um, You know, we know you're filming the second season of the TV show. And frankly, 
you're not Dr. Oz. You'll never be Dr. Oz. So I don't know why you're trying to do all this social media and all this media stuff. Mm. And frankly, we just think that you're doing too much. And we think it's time for you to find another job. And we just don't want you working here anymore. He said, Katie, this is my emergency room. I run the ship here. And at the end of the day, I want nurses in this emergency room to just come and be a nurse and go home. You're out here trying to have this huge voice and do all this media stuff. Mm. And again, you're never going to be a Dr. Oz because you're just a nurse. Mm. Look at the enemy of progress. I rebuke thee. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so like behind closed doors, I got fired because my director and my manager, um, I think they were either intimidated or jealous or they just didn't like that. I had an opinion and a voice and I talked about some real shit. Um, but the reason that they told me that they fired me to human resources was because I've made an insensitive post on social media on Instagram. But it was interesting because the doctor who actually p- took the picture and posted the empty trauma room, he never even got a conversation. Of course. So, yeah, we know. We know. You know mm. Flash forward, you know, like like years down the line, um, you know, the, what is this? However many years, five, six years later now. I have a whole second career on social media. <laughs> right? And it's kind of ironic. Look at that. And it's kind of ironic. That's how it works it's though. Kind of ironic. You know? so, That's how it works. Yeah. You know? So I like to tie all that I like to tie all that background in, you know, when I speak to people at my events because, you know, a lot of people think, Oh man, like I I just I you know, oh being in, being a social media influencer or having a big social media presence, it is not an overnight thing. I mean, it has taken years and years to get where I am. I have, you've gone through you know, ups I have and lost downs. Over that shit. Yeah, and yeah. you've gone through ups and downs. Yeah. You know, so um, that's, <laughs> I know I have like, I have like a 20 minute explanation for like every question you, you asked me, but you know, nothing in my life has really ever been like a one sentence reply. And it shouldn't be because that's why people are listening to this. They want to get the truth. They want to get the transparency, the honesty, because like you said, we, we as nurses, we're tired of seeing all the, the fake shit on social media. We're tired of, especially in nursing school. All I would see was just people graduating and having this perfect life as a nurse. And I'm over here failing. Or or it's just like every day is positive, happy, positive, happy, thankful, Working um, at this best hospital five. ever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All of that. Or just, or just like, oh, God, it's like, shut it's up too much. already. Yeah, you never, like, real. you never fuck up. Have you, it's like, have you never made a mistake? Have you ever just had a bad day? No, like, oh God, apparently have you not. you ever even ate, <laughs> and you, have you ever ate anything that's not like a perfect fucking piece of avocado toast? <laughs> <laughs> on top? You even eat. Like greasy burgers and French fries. Like, what's wrong with you? And I know dang well if you work in night shift, we have all ordered from every single restaurant that stays past twelve a.m. and it is not serving avocado on toast. Man, so come, man, come listen. Around. Ain't nobody got time for some fucking avocado toast at three a.m. Thank you. Any hospital, okay? Katie, Stop. I need to work at your hospital. My God, you got me rolling. Good lord, <laughs> that is. I'm so serious though. True. It's like. You know, and I understand social media. It's a perfectly curated, you know, selection of of your highlights of your life. But I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a fashion. I'm not a fashion blogger. Matter of fact, I wear I literally wear the same five outfits every fucking day of my life. And And it's typically smartest thing. Black leggings Mm -hmm. and like a black and like a black t-shirt. I I don't. You know, I'm not a fashion blogger. I'm not some sort of a um some sort of a person that you know, I'm not a food blogger. Like I don't have these perfect, um, like I just don't have these perfectly set up, you know, um, meal prep situations every single day. Together. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I just, I just, I just could never relate to any of that. And so I made a choice a long time ago. I was like, man, I'm just going to share my, my realistic, relatable, shit and if people want to follow me they want to fuck with me cool if they don't well then unfollow that's Keep cool going. too because there's 10 million other people out there that you can follow exactly you know and um it's interesting because when i look back i was traumatized when i got fired like i have been at that hospital for seven years that 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 place was my family i had no family in new york city except for 
the the medics and the EMTs and the ER and the nurses and the docs, like we were all family. And that really wow. fucked me up because when I got fired, they didn't even let me go to my locker to clean anything out. They had security escort me out oh, the back of the hospital. That's so sad. Girl, salty. like I like I done like I done stole some drugs. Right? Or something. Come like on. what? Like really? They even went and cleaned out my locker and brought it to me, like in the office. And I was like, "You really, y'all wow. really gonna do me like this?" That's okay. Real, that's real okay. Good. Seven years. But like I, yeah, right. But I mm. was man, I man, that that really that really fucked me up a lot. And I dealt with a lot of. To this day, I still have like PTSD. Like if I get a call from my director and she's like, "Hi, can you come by my office?" I like, have no, instant, tell like, me on the phone. No. <laughs> yep, yep. No, exactly. I have instant panic and instant, like instant. Cause what people don't realize is this was, this was completely out of nowhere. I had, I mean, completely out of nowhere. I was not on some 30 day probation period. I was not on some like step process where listen, you only got like one thing left. I had been written up for tardies before and I had been written up because um, a patient like wrote a complaint letter and they just happened to be some VIP donor, but they just got mad because I had them waiting in the waiting room. But anyway, but like, and so like I was traumatized, but like Mm -hmm. it took me a long time to get through that. And, you know, but for now to look at what my social media and stuff has done is it has opened up more opportunities for me. And I hate to say this, it's opened up more opportunities for me than nursing ever has. And I love Mm -hmm. nursing and nursing is nursing has been my rock and my like staple for so long, but I almost feel like I have more of a, more of a, you know, like a a benefit to my fellow human on social media than I do going to going to work and taking care of my eight to 10 patients. It's crazy because it's like, I, I can affect, you know, I can, I can help or inspire or guide or make, people laugh every day, you know, between three and 6,000 people who see my posts or like my posts, or I can go to the hospital and take care of eight people. Right. You know, so Your impact it's, is it's really something. Though. Yeah. And I, and I gotta say like, I, you know, my five-year plan, I think I would love to be per diem at the hospital. I would love to write a book and do, you know, like some sort of a speaking tour around the book. And, um, you know, even come out with, um, you know, like some, some sort of, some sort of something, you know, in nursing that is kind of like a first of its kind. I have no fucking clue what that is, but at the end of the day, I just, I just have all these ideas. So I look back and even though that whole thing was very difficult, you know, I would have never seen this, I would have never seen this five years ago, Mm -hmm. but the fact that I chose to stick, to stick with it here I am now and and you wouldn't you know we wouldn't be having this conversation if it didn't happen so we really would so I'm actually really happy you went through those things I know that not to sound like oh my gosh I wish you go through that again but if it was to lead you to where you are today to impact me and so many other nurses out there to continue to keep going by golly I hope it happens again because your impact is felt more than like you said just doing your one-on-one patient care for eight patients you're influencing generations of nurses that are coming in that are still in that want to give up, that have been fired, that have failed, that have gone through the true motions of life and the things that they go through in their career. So I'm very grateful for you even sharing and being so open on social media for your ups and your downs, not just the ups. And that's what's so important. Um, But what I really want to talk about now is duke it up. Like, girl, you already hey. doing things on social media, <laughs> but you got networking, social engagements outside of social media. And I want to know more about that for people who don't know. What is Duke It Up? Yeah. What is it about and how did it start? Absolutely. So, so Duke It Up is a, um, how, can I, how can I summarize it? D- the Duke It Up event series is, an, is a series of empowerment events geared at taking the relationships we develop on social media and translating that into real life community and support system within different cities across the United States. For the simple fact that A, a lot of people can't really speak freely in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people have the support system in the workplace or at their school, but C, we need to, um, one of the ways that we can tackle the bullying culture in 
nursing and in our profession and help with burnout is by having like-minded, positive people um, who want to take on the role of meeting other people come together. So when you take 50 to 100 people in one city, anywhere in the United States, and you put them in the same room and you know they're all nurses, nursing students, or grad students, or NPs, or PAs, or docs, they're all going to be in that room and every single person there is going to leave that night with either a new friend or a new mentor or a new preceptor or a new contact person for a potential job, or they're going to leave thinking, you know what, like I learned something from Katie's lesson tonight and now I know that I can do A, B, and C, or they're going to leave with a contact. If they're mm. like, you know, I kind of want to start my own brand one day, they're going to leave with my personal attorney's contact information who can help you go through trademarking and licensing. And they're going to leave with my graphic designer's information who can help you build a website. The purpose for these events is to break down those barriers that tend to form um, not only in our workplace, but also in our school system and just in life in general. So the Duke It Up event, um, you know, my last name is Duke. My nickname at my old boxing gym was Duke It Up, and um, that was kind of where I got it from. But, you know, what do you do when life gets tough? You duke it up. Hello? And so that is a little bit of the story behind behind the, the, the reason for the event, the purpose for the event. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's like I love social media stuff, but I want to do more. You have to kind of always think, all right, what's the next thing I can do? What, how can I grow this? How can I, how can I help more people? And how can we take this? beyond the iPhone and beyond, you know, the Android. Well, let's start doing some events. So the very first Duke It Up event I did, I actually um, was approached by, um, and Nurse Mo introduced me to Emerald Health Services. They're a travel nurse company based out of Los Angeles. Mm. And they love doing a lot of nurse networking events. And so um, they approached me. They were like, hey, we want to do an event in New York City. Do you want to host it? And I was like, oh, actually, interesting that you say that because I have been wanting to do speaking events on my own for a long time. Maybe we can test trial this thing out. And I've always done a lot of academic speaking events and I did a lot of, you know, like nursing conference events. I've spoken mm-hmm. pinning ceremonies and commencement ceremonies and, you know, um, graduation ceremonies and, and conferences and seminars. I've spoken at all that stuff, but it's a much different environment you know, um, at the Duke It Up event that it is at those events. Those are, you know, your, your academia events. There's a PowerPoint and there are tables of chairs. Okay. At the Duke It Up event, you ain't getting no PowerPoint. We are not talking about any nursing theory. There is no data, no statistics. And there are no notes. (laughs) You don't have to take notes. Um, so Emerald came and they were like, Hey, we'll help you with a venue and we'll, and we'll buy some food and drinks for the attendees. All you got to do is promote it and have your people come out. And there was like 75 people that showed up to the very first what? one last October come on. In, in New York City. Yeah. In New York City. So that was like, so that was, I, dude, when that happened, I was like, oh shit, people actually do listen to me. And they Why? Actually do I'm like actually kind of famous a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, because I show was like, man, listen, only five motherfucking people are going to show up to this mm-hmm. fucking event. And I'm going <laughs> to sit here and look like an ass. And I'm going to have to pay my, my sponsors back all this money. Oh but God. it happened. And so, um, you know, I realized I was like, I can, I could totally do this thing. I just need to think of, you know, a proper, um, a proper way to approach it. And, and I learned a new lesson with each event. So that was October last year. And so Emerald and I are partnered for a certain amount of events each year, but I do my own events, um, you know, without them as well. That is um, awesome. All together I've did. So I did New York City. um, I did New York City, Atlanta, D.C., um, Charlotte, Boston, Los Angeles. And um, oh, my gosh, there's one other city. And then I have Portland coming up in... um, in uh what do you call it november Mm. and then um in january i'll do another one in atlanta and then in february i'm doing two more in boston and then um i have i think the next steps would probably be um chicago and then miami and then maybe st louis after that but it's been a really great opportunity it has been very humbling um it's always very humbling when you when you like you stay up all night the night before worrying like are people going to show up and Mm -hmm. you know um 
and like like literally like still living paycheck to paycheck because you're spending so much money on promotional materials and graphic Girl. design work and people you know, only knew. buying hoodies and t-shirts to give away to people and you know people and recruiting knew. sponsors like i don't like i don't have an assistant i do not have a social media team i don't have a manager it is it is me wow. and so all of this like stuff you know like I have to go and set up for my events and like, I have to be the one to like create the event, right? And I'm the one who is, you know, sending all my information to these sponsors saying, Hey, can you contribute anything for the gift bags to give out to all my attendees? Because I want people to leave with something like to make them feel appreciated because yeah. all the other industries in the world, like I have a friend who works for Chase Bank, Chase Bank in New York city, like every month throws like an employee appreciation night at like a local hotsy totsy freaking rooftop. And those employees leave with like, 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 like legitimate swag bags Ugh. and they get free drinks and a cocktail hour. And you know what they do? They take care of people's money. Mm. We take care of humans. Their we life. take care of human lives. Oh and I'm like, damn, like, why don't we work in finance? These fucking people get lunch breaks every day. They make more money than us. Right? They get these amazing events from their employers. They get free lunch. They get free lunch. They have caterers on site that change weekly that come in and cook them free lunch. Yep. So My husband's in tech and he has about, that kind like, of so like, mm. Yeah. So it's like I'm reaching out to event sponsors and I'm like, hey, can you contribute for this and for that? You know, so like there's a lot of work that goes into these to these events. But then when I when I go there and I see people who are coming in and they're excited to be there and they're happy to be there and they're like they're like I've been following you for six years and you have oh, no idea wow. what happened you know you sent me you replied to a message of mine three years ago and you gave me some advice and now I'm a nurse and I'm like God I mean it's like wow. it's it's like bone chilling yeah. it's bone chilling and because. You can't you can't buy that kind of human connection. You you can't buy that kind of genuine authenticity. So you know the events um, they have a really great purpose. They definitely have grown in the last year. Um, they're not where I want to be yet, but again, there's always a lesson as a work in progress, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm going to try to make them a little more. Um, trying to try to get things a little more organized going into 2019. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but. Along all this way, I've also met some really great sponsors. Like I've been working with Cherokee Uniforms for five years now, and they have been um, like my first pair of scrubs was like Dickies and Cherokee. Like they've always been a household name they for me, have. and for I think, I, and for I think like for every single nurse ever. But they have supported my events. Like I literally called Deb over at Cherokee one day, and I was like, "So um, you're in Los Angeles." Um, I have an event, um, in Boston in like three days. Can you just send me a bunch of stuff to give away? And like, they had literally like, like overnighted, like three or four Littman cardiology stethoscopes, oh, a bunch of like, wow. and like, and like Reebok tennis shoes and like 10 pairs of like full set scrubs of all inclusive sizes and a bunch of like gift cards for percentage off this. And, and like, and I was just wow. like, man, like, like, you know, like you really appreciate that kind of support yeah. because, you know, healthcare, it's crazy. Whenever you look at the employee perks of other industries, typically business and finance and, and like real estate mm. and tech, I mean, they, those employees, um, you know, and not to, and not to demean their work because everybody's work is valued because mm -hmm. you all have a different role, but it's like, damn, y'all motherfuckers get bonuses yes. just for like signing contracts. Yeah. Like you guys get like, like Morton's steak dinner as your like employee night out. Right. Do you know what we get? We get like the same breakfast that you can get in the cafeteria. They Every just bring it up to the unit in week. the atrium and say happy <laughs> nurses week. <laughs> <laughs> Every, why did everybody know that? Everybody knows the same breakfast, the same lunch. If you night shift, you're going to get the same thing. It's just the administrative serve it to you. Yay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> They Thanks. serve it to you with the apron and they say thank you. And, um, you and know, they look at your badge, and, and, and you get your name, like, they don't know you. Yeah. And it's just like, damn, man. So, like, I, like, I'm like, you know, when I, when I have these really great opportunities and I have sponsors like, like Cherokee and, um, you know, and, and, and Emerald who, who do want to, like, actually say, 
like we care about nurses. We appreciate the work nurses do. We are a company for nurses and, and we value the input and, and all this. Like it's really, it really adds to my event. It so, does. Um, I know we totally got off subject. But Girl, no, this that's is kind needed. Of the, that's kind of, that's kind of like the all around, the all around for, for the Duke it up event. But to, in summation, I would, you know, ideally for 29, going forward for 2019, the events, um, I'm going to probably do, I'm going to try to do a city, a city per like six weeks, a city per month. If I could maybe, if I could maybe, if I could maybe bring on like an assistant or get some better like funding as far as like, you know, putting on the events, then I would say a city a month would be ideal. Mm -hmm. But if not, then like a different city every six weeks or so, I think, I think is realistic. And then just kind of get things a little more streamlined and, um, you know, really make it something special. So, Katie, goodness, girl. Like I... I'm speaking this into existence. I'm going to come to one of your events and I'm going to host it live. I'm like, hey, wait, live is on I am speaking it into existence because you have no idea as a nurse, when I was in nursing school, if I would have known that there was things like this, this would have helped encourage so many nurses that are in nursing school that go through it almost alone and go through all the struggles. And then not only that, being a nurse at the bedside and being burnt out and not having like a circle or networking function where you can go and be free, take off your wig, wipe off your eyebrows, just be yourself, right. have fun. Network. Oh my God, wait, pause. Girl. Wipe off the eyebrows. Yes, honey. I got like seven pieces. <laughs> I have seven pieces of eyebrows. So uh, everybody already know that. I draw them on in the morning and I call them a day. <laughs> I have no shame. Listen, man, I, love- like, I was thinking about getting microblading done, actually, because I'm sick of putting my eyebrows on every day. I won't leave the house. I'll leave the house without a bra, but my eyebrows are always on. Always. On. I got you have to know my expressions. I don't want you to be confused on what I am projecting out of my face. So I'm going to have some eyebrows on for you. I might not have my wig on, yeah. but you're going to get where, some eyebrows. Where are you at? <laughs> What's I'm it? in the Bay Area. <laughs> I am in Northern the California, girl. Yes, you got to come out to Silicon Valley. So is that like San Diego, San Francisco? I don't San know. San Jose. What is that? That's it? like San Jose, San Francisco, Mountain View, pretty much where all the tech okay. companies are. Apple, Google, Tesla, all of them are out here. So I live in the middle How of all How far are you from Portland? I don't know. I have to put that on the map because I'm from Texas and this is brand new for me. <laughs> this whole Bay Area is very yeah. new for me. So I have to see, I have to actually check. I feel like, I'm check. I feel like Portland, Portland, Oregon might be like within a few hours of there. I mean, I, um, damn, like, I mean, shit, if you want to come to Portland, I'll be Portland. Um, November 16th is the Portland, Oregon, Duke it up event. Oh, um, let me go ahead and put that and on the I map. I definitely had an event in Los Angeles in July, but you know, I know that that's a, like a, a far from, you know, like the Bay area, but I'm gonna uh, it's try, a I'm gonna try 45 to minute flight, honey. Sure. It's 45 minute flight. I'm oh, actually going bad. to LA this weekend. I mean, not this weekend, this end of this month for another conference as well. Um, kind of hosting it live. Oh, that's so, bad. Yeah, I want because I really want nurses. Oh, look at you. Look at you. Look yeah, at you. Hustle. I'm trying to hustle. bring stuff like this to nurses. I really want them to know what's out there, all these resources. I'm tired of people not being able to go to conference and know what's being in there because they're so expensive or they're their healthcare company won't cover the cost. I want them to be involved in the new mm-hmm. changes and things that are going on. I just don't feel like it's fair. So yes, I understand what you mean yep. about using your resources, girl, because all this is self-funded. Like I, uh, all this is self-funded, all learning how to, you know, do a podcast, learning how to do video editing, just to make sure that that knowledge that I wish I had is out there for other nurses. And it's just, it's rewarding. I mean, at the end of the day, yes, I hope that, you know, God willing this you know, works itself out. But as of right now, all my sacrifice and everything I'm doing, it it is very meaningful because I know it's impacting so many other nurses out there or aspiring nurses or nursing students when you when you talk from the heart about you know, yeah. having to do it all. Having to do it all and still work a full time job. You know, it's 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 yeah. not easy. But Katie, mm-hmm. I I just thank you so, so much for what you're doing. Thank you for being Aww. transparent on social media. Thank you for duking it up and giving us a, an environment where we can feel appreciated. Even if we don't on Nurses Week, we got somewhere we can network and have fun. With <laughs> Even if we eating that shitty breakfast on Nurses Week. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, what, you, what we let should probably stop, do. Let me stop before I get fired from another job. <laughs> <laughs> right, from a hospital to be like, um, hold up. I heard you had a problem with our Nurses Week last week. <laughs> But you know what? Hey. So, Katie, we were listening to Toby talks, and we would like to talk to you about the breakfast <laughs> comments for Nurses Week. And, and you're like, like, 
what? What you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. You you want to talk about improvements? Because I have improvement ideas. Because that breakfast sucks. So let's talk about how we can really appreciate our nurses. <laughs> and maybe one day... And maybe one day we will have so many other companies that would like love to support us on Nursing Week and we can throw a huge event. I mean, I like to think outside the box, so you never know what we can do. But um, So I'll give you I'll give you a heads up now. Nurses Week 2019, we're going to take a huge group of nurses. We're going to do Nurses Take Disneyland. We're going to spend the whole day ooh, together. Y'all hear that? So mm, mark that's your in your state of California. Yeah. Um. So I will be there. Um, it's already in the works. Like last year, there was a group of like 40 or 50 nurses that went. Wow. And um, it's really, it's really fun because like, it's just like a fun day to just, to just, just be carefree and just mm -hmm. like, and, and just fun. have fun and just have fun with each other, you know, like eat turkey legs and, and freaking, um, you yes. know, um, funnel, funnel cake, cake like four or five yes. funnel cakes. <laughs> no, yeah. no avocado on toast at Disneyland, y'all. Funnel cakes no, and first of all, <laughs> like I'm like okay, avocado on toast isn't bad, but I'm not that basic Becky. Okay, mm -mm. I like bacon. I love me some biscuits. Like, listen, and Girl. no offense to the avocado toast Instagram posters, but like, I had to unfollow a lot of people recently because if I saw one more like perfect <laughs> plate of like macro and micro and protein and carb counted like pre measured oh pre weighted food, I. I literally was like, who the fuck has time for that? Like, Girl. I, who has, like, my God, I understand if you're like, if you're a fitness, if you're a fitness influencer or if you are like a nutritionist, but damn son, like, I ain't trying to weigh my meat. I'm not trying to like count it anything except hard. for, like, I'll look on the box and I'll be like, and I'll be like, is this low carb? No. Okay. Let me reconsider. Cause I try to stay a little low carb or mm -hmm. else I would be back to 200 pounds again. But like, damn man. Anyway, like, you're talking to go. a Nigerian like, from the South. Okay. Trust me. I know everything out here in California. No offense to my Cali people. I love y'all excluding LA. Y'all still taste like kale. Have you found I'm anywhere tired. with any, with any yellow rice? Not out here. No, I make my own jollof rice, honey. We make my, I make my own goosey, my own stew. We, me and my husband just have to do it because it's really hard out here to find seasonings, but the Ethiopian restaurants can be bomb out get, here though. Can you even get goat? Can you even get goat in where you're at? Apparently, yeah, because they actually killed them live in Gilroy, like on the southern part. I bet you everyone listening to this whole conversation is going to be busting out laughing right now because we clearly are just doing our own thing. And I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, to totally normal. Listen, my, so my, my, boy my boyfriend is Jamaican. He lives in D.C., which is one reason why I spend so much time back and forth between New York and D.C. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I cannot live somewhere where I can't have quick access to oxtail. Ooh, and girl. I can't have quick access to, to, to goat and where I can't have quick, quick access to like rice and fucking beans. Okay. Hey, like hey, I, I need, like, are you my soul? Like, are we soul sisters? Because everything you just mentioned, I think we are every day. Okay, good, good. good I think girl. we are. I'm glad. I think we saying. are. It's kind of, fu it's kind of funny because, um, the other night he had some friends over and, um, a couple of the residents that he's kind of mentoring, um, there's, there's two Nigerian women and one of them, her name is Chica. And mm -hmm. anytime she comes in, he like, he does his impression of her father, who is also a doctor. <laughs> and he's always like, ah, ah, Chica. And he does <laughs> his impression of, of her father and it makes everybody laugh. And then he starts talking about the jaw of rice. And it's like this back and forth banter. And it's like, I, love it. I don't have any of that living in Missouri. I love Ever. you. You won't, honey. I'm not sure I know any Africans in Missouri. No, if y'all out there, shout no, out to y'all. Uh, no, no, there are no Cameroonians. There are no Africans. There are no like Sudanese. There are no Ethiopians. There are no Nigerians. Well, there are me, no Jamaicans in Missouri. Let me tell you Missouri, something. Okay? If you ever have an event in Houston, Texas, that is originally where I'm from, the SWAT, Southwest Ailey, Texas, that's where all the Nigerians are. So uh, if you ever pop up there, best believe I will be in your backpack because that's my home city. You're going to have the bomb cooking. Oh, you Jackie. So many Nigerians. <laughs> You're going to pretty much oh be in God. Nigeria, pretty Say much. No more. 
<laughs> yep. Nope. Say no more. Say no more. But Katie, <laughs> as I wrap up this wonderful, wonderful interview, I want you to just drop a word of inspiration, especially to the nursing students out there who are probably just like trying to duke it out of nursing school. And then for the nurses that are on the units that are even in any area of healthcare that just feel like giving up or feel like they're burnt out, what kind of word of inspiration can you drop for them that are listening to this episode to keep going? So here to, to close our Toby Talks and Katie Duke edition, here is my <laughs> advice for nursing students. If you are feeling overwhelmed, if you are feeling like you um, have not made the right decision, if you are feeling like you can't hang, if you have professors or clinical instructors or preceptors making you feel like you are an idiot, mm. you have to take a step back and realize that you are normal. Mm -hmm. Every single person feels at some point in time throughout their studying, whatever program that they're doing, that they are, are, that they are failing, that they are dumb, that they are in the wrong profession. Don't ever go into nursing not expecting that because it will happen, but you have to be prepared for it. And you know how you prepare? You have to expect that you're going to make mistakes. You have to expect that you might fail a test. And you also have to expect that you're going to face adversity. And you also have to expect that these are all a part of the process. So there are people that when they face those moments, they let themselves get down and they stay down. But part of what makes each of us special as individuals is we have the ability that when we get put down like that, and we go through those really bad moments of despair that we can lift ourselves back up. Because you know what? At the end of the day, you got two options. You can sit down and you can waddle around in your own shit. Or you can sit down, be there for a few minutes, eat a 20 piece of chicken nuggets with barbecue sauce and get your ass back up and keep it moving. Mm. At the end of the day, you're the only person that can do that. So that's my advice for nursing students. My advice for nurses as we close this Toby Talks and Katie Duke motherfucking edition Hello. is this. Do not tolerate bullying. You cannot let people make you feel bad for what you're doing at work and that means you can't let people bully you at work now if you're one of those people with a shy personality that's fine i understand that but you still should never tolerate anybody disrespecting you or bullying you but there's another aspect to this argument if you're one of those people who witness bullying and you do not stand up or step in or do anything for your fellow nurse you are just as guilty as the bully itself because if you are not a problem, if you are not a part of the solution, you are the problem. Because we have so much bullying these days, not only from the bullies, but we have so much bullying these days from people just being passive bystanders. Yeah. And this goes beyond, beyond nursing, beyond the bedside. This is also for all those people that don't stand up and you know speak out against what Trump is doing. This is for all those people that don't stand up and speak out about sexual, um, you know, about sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And this also goes for all those people that don't stand up and speak out about the racial injustices that young black men and women face in the United States. And this is mm -hmm. also for all those people that just stand by and think in their head, man, this is this this isn't wrong. And they turn their head and they walk away because it doesn't happen to them. <laughs> So to all you nurses out there, if you are not standing up for your colleague, you're, you're a part of the problem as well. So we need to change our attitude. And if you're feeling burnt out, you know what? Go get another job. You have a degree that's easily transferable anywhere you want to go. If you're unhappy, you can change that. Nobody's forcing you to work in the ICU. No one's forcing you to work on the med surge floor. If you feel the need that you're getting burnt out and you feel the need to make a change, then do it. Do not ever just settle for a job because it might have a glorious ring to it. There's so many opportunities out there. Don't be scared to take a leap of faith and try something new because at the end of the day, your peace of mind and your happiness are the only thing that will keep you through the future part of your life. Your job will not. You have to be happy and you need peace of mind. I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast episode. There were so many gems dropped, but let's be honest. Who got time to replay, pause, and write down all that information shared? Shoo, I know I don't. But don't worry, I got you. Download Toby Talks app on Google Play for nursing resources, definitions, and so much more that were mentioned on today's episode. 
Toby Talk app features show notes that timelines the conversation and lets you click directly to the resource or definition. And it even lets you bookmark the gem for later. Listen, we're too busy learning how to save lives or even saving lives as nurses to deal with a replay button. Toby Talk app is your one-stop shop for podcast episodes and show notes. For more on Toby Talks, like the blogs and videos, go to my website at www.tobytodge.com. And you know I love to hear from you guys, so feel free to slide into my DMs on IG or Facebook and hit me up through email. That's tobytalks at tobytodge.com. Again, that's tobytalks at tobytodge.com. Till next time, I'll be talking to you soon.